Let's talk for a minute about word expanders. Word expanders are very similar to Word's autocomplete feature or autocorrect feature, if you're used to that or understand that. Basically, you program a few letters, and when you hit the space bar, it automatically expands out to maybe one or two words. It could be an entire paragraph. So just as a couple of examples that I have here, TN space could, be ten could expand out to be tenderness. Or as you're transcribing along, you might type IDA space, and it would expand out iron deficiency anemia. REX could be rectal examination. CA might expand out to carcinoma. The big thing about expanders is that each transcriptionist builds their own glossary. Some of them do come with um, some glossaries in them already, but if you make your own glossary, you're more uh, liable to understand it and remember to use them. And some of our transcriptionists have thousands and thousands of entries into our um, into their libraries, and you can understand why, because it can make them very, very um, efficient the bigger their word expander glossaries are. So while word expanders can be great for our productivity, we do have to be careful about proofreading um, because it can easily pr expand out to information that is not right. So just as our um, looking at our few examples that I had in the first slide, in the previous slide, we said TN was tenderness, so Memphis, Tennessee might expand out to Memphis tenderness. Jose, California, we said CA was our, our um, word expansion for carcinoma. Ida Robinson, a name, Ida, obviously, that iron deficiency anemia Robinson. And look at poor Rex Mor Morris here, how he expands out. That's not good. So we need to just be aware, if we do use word expanders, that we really have to be on high alert about um, these letters expanding out. Similar to the word expansion software, also many companies use boilerplate paragraphs. So that these are pre-dictated paragraphs for each individual um, dictator, and they might say, put in my usual closing paragraph or put in my number three paragraph. And these are, again, just pre-dictated paragraphs so that the transcriptionist can just, with the click of a few keys, can automatically get an entire paragraph of information out. Um, and it's great for productivity, but again, we have to be careful about how these expand out. Does it make sense? Does it make sense where the paragraph is? Sometimes the dictator will give you a number, and it's not always right. Does it make sense? So they're wonderful tools for productivity, but again, we just have to be on alert. Does it make sense where they're at in the report? As I mentioned previously, Word does have a great find and replace feature. So if an error is found several times throughout a report, you might use this type of, um, of feature. And you can find, for instance, if we have Martha as heat as the patient's name, and it really should be Marta. Obviously, we've got a spelling error there. The way to make sure we've caught all of those errors would be to do the find and replace. In the find area, you would put Martha, replace it with Marta, and very quickly you could have all of those um, corrected. As far as editing goes, you should realize that um, you are not just doing verbatim dictation for the most part. Some employers will want you to do verbatim, which is exactly what the dictator says. But in most instances, you are given full rights to do minor editing, as long as it doesn't change the meaning of what's being said or the style and personality of the dictator. Um, so what does that mean? Well, grammar is a big one. Um, dictators, as they're dictating letters, maybe eating lunch, getting ready for a meeting, as they're doing this quickly, they might not, not use the correct um, grammar, they might dictate punctuation that isn't correct. You're the expert. You can go ahead and do that editing and um, do it as necessary for that. Again, as long as it doesn't change the meaning of what's being said or the style and personality of the dictator, you are um, able to go ahead and edit.
And here are just a few more examples of permissible editing where you can go ahead and feel free to edit if necessary, such as subject verb agreement. The reports in the doctor's office were ready for signature. The reports were ready. Um, we want to make sure that they agree between the subject and the agreement. We wouldn't say the reports in the doctor's office was ready for signature. The reports was ready. Doesn't make sense, right? So we can go ahead and change something similar to that, subject verb agreement. Um, word usage. The patient was lying on the floor. I seen the patient last evening. Is that right? No, I saw the patient last evening. Him and me were chosen to attend the event. Is that right? No. Him and I. How about the next one? She neither smokes or drinks. Neither nor either or. So she neither smokes nor drinks is the correct way for that one. And just a few more examples of when you might go ahead and edit. Uh, what might be dictated, noun versus adjective forms. So replace the aortic valve. We would not say replace the aorta valve. Even if that was dictated, we would change it to aortic valve. because We use it as an adjective there. Singular versus plural forms. The conjunctiva were inflamed. That's wrong. Conjunctiva is singular. So if we really are talking about more than one, which is usually the case, the conjunctiva, V-A-E, were inflamed, or the conjunctiva was inflamed. We're really talking about one. More than likely, we're talking about more than one. Almost always, it's plural. Not always, but most most times it would be. So it would be conjunctiva, conjunctiva were inflamed. And there are several of these types of medical words out there. A few more examples: misplaced expressions. The patient had a hysterectomy, leaving one tube and ovary in Jacksonville. Hmm, that sounds kind of strange, doesn't it? We want to recast that sentence. While in Jacksonville, the patient had a hysterectomy, leaving one tube and ovary. Sounds a little bit better, right? We can also look at verb tenses. What do we do about this? Do we use a past tense in our paragraph, present, future? What do we use? Many dictators will mix these up within the same paragraph, and sometimes we're going to change that. The AHC Book of Style has some information about it. Go out there and look it up and read it about verb tenses. What do we use? How do we change? When we talk about tenses of paragraphs within reports, usually history of present illness and past medical history areas are usually dictated in past tense. The review of systems, physical exam, usually dictated in present tense. And then the plan or recommendations are usually dictated in the future tense. We've talked a little bit about these homonyms or these sound-alike words. Um, Appendix B on pages 446, 447 shows some of these sound-alikes there. Go ahead and take a look at them. They'd be a great inclusion into your information station when you're done with our course here. Let's look at a couple of them here. Mucus is a very um, often used medical term. Dictated a lot, um, but there are two ways to spell mucus. And you might see this on a quiz. And you might see this on the final, hint, hint. You might find it. I might ask you to, to be able to write a sentence using mucus and mucus correctly, because it is used so often. M-U-C-U-S, mucus, is a noun, such as the patient had mucus coming out of his nose. It's kind of gross, but it's a medical term that is dictated a lot. M-U-C-U-S is a noun. M-U-C-O-U-S is an adjective. And a lot of times it is tied with the word membranes, such as mucous membranes. So if you can remember that, M-U-C-O-U-S is the adjective. The patient had a cold and her mucous membranes were inflamed. That would be an example of that one. So M-U-C-O-U-S is the adjective. How about perineal and perineal? Sound alike. They're spelled differently. Not a whole lot differently, but enough, and they mean very different things. Do you know what they mean? 
The first one, P-E-R-I-N-E-A-L, means pertaining to the perineum or the pelvic floor. Very different from P-E-R-O-N-E-A-L, which means pertaining to the fibula. So we would have to know what area of the body are we talking about, which one is correct. And that's what we mean by everything has to make sense. We talked a little bit about slang and short forms, brief forms, when we talked about our um, abbreviations unit a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but it is totally fine to go ahead and edit those. In fact, you should. We have a list in the back of our book that shows um, many of these brief forms and, and short forms that need to be changed or expanded out. So spell out abbreviated forms of complete words, such as psych eval, which should be psychiatric evaluation. Write out some of these other um, expressions that are used for real words, such as the patient was flatlined and was pronounced we would want to expand that out. The patient expired and was pronounced dead at whatever time. Again, find it in your book of style if you want to have a little bit more information about this. And our textbook does talk about these brief forms and slang that we really shouldn't be using, even if the dictators dictate it. A few other bits of information regarding proofreading and editing. If you are doing transcription, the material is hard to hear. Repeat the word, slow it down, listen ahead. And you can slow down the dictation to an extent, but after a little bit, the whole integrity of the sound of the voice of the dictator might be lost. And it might be sound really slow. And even harder to understand. I know you're all laughing at me now, aren't you? Um, but it's true. Sometimes it makes it even harder to understand if you slow it down too much. Another area that can be very difficult with transcription is um, transcribing for these English as a Second Language um, providers. Um, th this can really be a challenge. So if you do frequently encounter these um, English as a Second Language dictators, you're going to want to do some practice. AHCI does have units and specific um, extra information on transcribing for English as a Second Language dictators. You might consider that. For that, my only real bit of advice is just practice. It's the only way to get good with those, those types of dictators. Um, and at first, it would be very, very difficult. I remember leaving tons and tons of blanks from doctors who were from uh, maybe China or Germany um, or India, very difficult to understand. But in time, you do start to understand what they're saying, and they say the same things over and over. But at first, it can be very frustrating. So just to realize that, it just takes practice with those English as a second language dictators. Ask odds and ends here. Um, avoid contractions. We've talked about contractions before. Unless it's in a quote, we're going to expand it out. She'll need to see a specialist. Dictators will say it like that. We're going to transcribe. She will need to see a specialist, unless it's in a direct quote. Um, again, don't type material that doesn't make sense. You're going to flag it, tag it, card it, mark it, whatever your employer wants you to do so the dictator knows that there's a question out there. And here's a quote from Vera Pyle, who was a certified medical transcriptionist and the founding member of AHDI. She says, quote, to me a blank is an honorable thing. It means you don't know. Leaving a blank is preferable to guessing. Um, and just so you know, a blank that is filled in with the doctor's handwriting in ink is legal and acceptable. So for those institutions who are still using paper records, it's fine to have the doctor just go ahead and write it in a blank, fill it in. Doesn't necessarily have to go back to the transcriptionist to be typed in. It's totally fine that way. Um, and in electronic health record arena, usually the doctor just go, goes ahead and inserts that information um, right onto the report um, themselves.
And here's a list of, few, of a few strategies to proofread, some habits and hints to give a try. Proofread as you go, and don't go too fast. Read it on the screen before you print it. If you're doing transcription, replay it again if necessary. If you're allowed that, go ahead and do that. Sometimes, have you ever noticed that if you close it out and come back to it later, you'll find some mistakes? So cool off, read it again. Uh, read backwards, word for word. That will make you specifically focus on each and every word. Read it out loud. Have you ever done that? Try that. Sometimes you'll notice by reading it out loud, you'll find mistakes. And proofread it one more time before submitting it or printing it. Check out page 180 and 181 of your textbook. Notice the sounded like drug names here that are listed. Obviously, it would be a very critical error if you use the wrong drug name in one of your um, healthcare documentation records. So be aware of, the, of some of these um, drugs that sound alike, and obviously there's a lot more than just what's shown in herbal care, but this is a good start. Let's discuss quality assurance worksheets for just a minute. Many facilities who have transcriptionists do review the work of their transcriptionists for quality um, often. Many times a month, just randomly reports will be pulled, and they'll listen to the dictation and go through and, and grade it, see how you're doing. So that's a quality check. Um, our book does show a couple of examples of quality assurance worksheets on pages 174 and 175. So those are a couple of examples. Most of these have, um, depending on each error, it's rated as far as what um, the error rate weight is and how much you would be deducted from that. And your transcription instructors might use a similar quality assurance worksheet to give you feedback. And I know um, when I teach the medical transcription virtual practicum class for the transcription students, I do use a quality assurance worksheet. If you click onto the next slide here, it's just an example of what I do use in that class. So this is the quality review um, cover sheet that I do use for all transcription assignments in the virtual practicum class for the medical transcription of students. Um, and you'll notice that I have different categories here, critical errors, versus non-critical errors, and it is done in Excel, so it automatically um, calculates it out. But something such as the patient's name being wrong, or maybe the medical record wrong, or a, a wrong medical word used, or it was misspelled, drug names, errors that change the meaning, notice they're all minus 1.5. And when you're trying to get an accuracy of 98% or higher, those can really um, change your quality review, so be aware of that. Uh, Non-critical errors, things such as, here's our continuous page. If we have a second page of report and it's not done correctly, be 0.5. Uh, misused abbreviations, 0.5. Uh, grammar error, punctuation error that don't change the meaning of the sentence, 0.25, but those can really add up, let me tell you. So just to realize this is um, just an, another example of a quality review worksheet and in the real world, you want to have a quality review. You want somebody to be pulling your report so that you can learn and grow and understand um, if you're making a mistake so that they call it to your attention and that you can always strive to get better and better. The main proofreader marks are found in our textbook on page 177 to 179. And you should know the main ones. Um, I do not test you on them, but I do believe that you do learn them in your medical or in your proofreading and editing course. So I don't spend a lot of time on them here, but you should know the main proofreader marks because many uh, physicians do use them, especially if you're helping them to revise something. Maybe you're revising a research paper for them or something. Um, they would probably use the proofreader marks. So you should know your main proofreader marks. Knowledge is power, and the researching transcriptionist uses the lack of knowledge to obtain more knowledge. And this is what you as the beginner must really focus on at this point. An educated transcriptionist is prepared to recognize potential errors 
because of an increased understanding of medicine. So those areas would stand out to you more um, if, you, if you are a little bit more experienced. So obviously, ask when in doubt, look things up, and you really do need to take the time right now to be researching and understanding everything that's coming at you. And the art of making corrections just states that most transcriptionists perform proofreading operations so skillfully and discreetly that the majority of dictators never even suspect that their dictation has undergone revision or that it needed it. So when we talk about permissible editing, for the most part, your dictators are not even going to know that you changed it. You make them look good, and that's, that's great. That's part of the job. To sum it up here, proofreading and editing can be compared to house cleaning. If you've done it well, no one will notice the work you have put into it. But if the work has not been done, you'll look careless. And I think this is um, a pretty, pretty good analogy here, um, comparing house cleaning to, to proofreading. When we think back to the very first beginning of this lecture, when I, t when I asked, you know, have you ever done anything that's made you embarrassed, sent something out with a mistake, I think we all know how that feels. So, Let's uh, really strive for our good quality documents. And before I sign off from this week's lecture, I have one more YouTube video here. Some of the information that you're going to see and examples that you'll see here are kind of funny. Uh, some of them are unbelievable that people actually um, made these typos. And think about the money and customer base that might have been lost because of the typos. So proofreading is obviously a very important topic, too. I wish you all to have a great week, and we will be in touch soon. Thanks for listening to the lecture, and we'll see you later.